Uh, just to announce that uh, for this session, I will be the host for question answers. We will follow the same format that we've been doing so far. So this afternoon, we are starting a new series of lectures on stars and the interstellar medium by Professor Sri Anand from Ayuka. So over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I am Sri Anand. And I will uh, teach you. Uh, I have three lectures and we will be discussing about stars and uh, material in between stars known as interstellar medium. Okay. Uh, before I start, I thank Asim for taking responsibility for collating questions and doing. I, I understand that this, these are difficult times. Uh, thank you, Asim, for doing this. Okay, so today's uh, lecture will focus on um, what how stars shine at a constant rate and what keeps star as we see. Okay, this is what we are, we will try to cover in this lecture. So to start with, uh, we can look at uh, what we know about sun. I think from there we can move on. There are several things you would have learned by now. Uh, one is known as solar constant, which is nothing but the amount of energy you receive in earth per unit area per unit time. This is a flux of sun received in earth, which is of this order, 1.38 into 10 to the six X per second per centimeter square. Of course, these days it is a bit higher, I suppose, because it's too hot. The second quantity, which uh, I see you, you have been told by Shomak this morning uh, is uh, what is known as one AU. And he showed you up to several deci decimal places. Basically, we can remember it is like 1.5 times 10 to the 13 centimeters. This is the distance between uh, Earth and Sun, which is which also is known as one astronomical unit. If you look at the radius of Sun, it's of the order of 7, 10 to the 10 centimeters. Okay, and you can see that this factor is something like 200, right? Uh, the size of the uh, radius of the Sun to the distance between us and sun, these numbers are interesting. Given this, you can actually calculate what is the solar luminosity. What is luminosity? Luminosity is the energy per unit time, right? So solar luminosity, basically sun, sun's luminosity is of the order of 4, 10 to the 33 X per second. This luminosity, we, what is called bolometric luminosity means like, this is the energy emitted over all frequency band which you can observe as well as the ones which you don't observe. Okay, This is the, what is known as bolometric luminosity. It is the actual luminosity from sun, luminosity of sun. Okay, And what we observe uh, will be part of it because some lights won't come inside the Earth's atmosphere. Okay? Mass of the sun turns out to be 2 into 10 to the 33 grams. I am assuming that uh, these numbers uh, so you know how to calculate them because I, I see Swamak is explaining you how to calculate distances. If you know distances and if you know periods of uh, Earth going around Sun, you know it. Or any other planet going around Sun and distance of the planet and Sun, you can calculate mass of Sun. Okay. So these, these things are known. So these are the numbers which we have from Sun, right? Okay. Now, if... Uh, if you mathematically ask what is the luminosity, okay, then you can say that can I assume sun to be a black body? For this lecture, let's assume sun to be a black body. And you know that what is the total energy radiated by a black body per unit time? Uh, that is given by sigma t to the power 4. Okay, So this is the sigma t to the power 4. And total luminosity uh, should come from uh, 4 pi r square sigma t to the power 4. Okay, so this is the luminosity which you are receiving. So if we know the radius of sun, right, and the luminosity of the sun, you can calculate what is the effective temperature of the sun. You can do other way around. Suppose some method by which you measure the temperature of the sun. If you know the luminosity of the sun, you can calculate radius. Okay, I will go in the way I have uh, planned here. So basically, uh, if you plug in these numbers and you will find that the temperature of the sun turns out to be 5,700 Kelvin. So this, this all of us know, if you ask what is the temperature of the sun, you will say 6,000 Kelvin, right? This is, this is a rough 
number you have to remember so this is kind of temperature corresponding to the luminosity if it is coming from the radius which we have assumed here okay okay now you can also do the following you know the mass you know the radius you can calculate what is the average density of sun okay average density of sun turns out to be 1.4 grams per centimeter cube it's a very interesting number if you know uh, this is very close to what is the density of water so there are people making joke right I mean, like if you have slightly salty water for example like the one we have in the sea assume that sun like object if you put it in sea it will actually float this is this, uh, this is what people uh, make uh, light weighted comments about the densities right the densities are very low this is what you have to remember average density of sun is not very high this is 1 gram per centimeter cube so now we can uh, we can uh, make some whatever logical argument to see that what kind of sources can generate this this much amount of energy so let's say tau this tau being the lifetime of sun for for the time being we can take 5 into 10 to the 9 years okay if you take 5 into 10 to the 9 years and you take uh, a solar luminosity okay so that means like what is the total amount of energy sun would have emitted till now for example you can ask this question right so that will be luminosity this is energy per unit time multiplied by time and it turns out to be something like 6 into 10 to the 50 ergs okay so sun would have emitted this much amount of energy over a period of this much time i think this should be in years and i have appropriately converted to get this number okay so total energy to mass ratio suppose if you ask like okay what is the amount of energy i receive from a uh, object of this mass so i say e by m star uh, this uh, m dot is dot with a circle dot inside a circle denotes sun this is energy per unit mass of sun will be of the order of 3 into 10 to the 17 ergs per gram so the way we have done is that we can some we have used some number for characteristic time scale for sun like star and we know what is the amount of energy per unit time it is emitting and we know that what will be the total amount of energy it will emit over a period of this much amount of time and if i am going to convert this from mass and what is the kind of ergs per gram i need to get okay this much this much this must be related to efficiency at which i can convert mass into energy okay you are with me till now right i, I suppose okay we started with basic parameters of sun we just write down this standard equation which we know we get some idea of what is the temperature then we took some idea of what kind of total energetics involved over the period of sun and then we have number which which is basically energy per mass now you can ask for example so you take mass 10 grams of uh, wood okay you burn it then you then you ask like how much amount of energy i will get of burning wood okay then that will give you an idea if i burn a m gram of uh, wood what is the amount of ergs per second or ergs in total i will get okay so this exercise we can do so this is what i am going to call uh, uh, energy to mass ratio which we got as 3 into 10 to the 17 ergs per gram this is what we are hoping to achieve if you take standard chemical reactions you this chemical reaction i generically say any reaction in earth which you give you energy like you burn coal or you burn gas, you burn something, you can ask this question, what is the conversion ratio of mass to energy? And you will find a typical chemical reaction will give you only 10 to the 12 x per gram, which means that if sun were to emit energy, like the way we are burning coal or we are burning any other thing, how much time it will take, you can clearly see there is a factor 10 to the 5. So if the efficiency is a bit like chemical reaction sun cannot survive more than 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 years the fact that we are here for such a long time the energy generation cannot be through the known process which we use uh, a day in day to day life okay so what could be the other energy which you can think of of course immediately you can say oh look this mass is very large okay the mass is like 10 to the 33 grams it's huge okay and it looks like a blob can we do the following for example this guy will have some amount of potential energy potential energy means there is gravity and the gravity holds the uh, 
uh, all the particles in the sun together you can say that okay let us convert this potential energy into some radiation vaguely right you know how to convert a, convert a potential energy into radiation if you don't know you take a ball you stand in a whatever tall building just leave a ball and ball will tell you how potential energy can be converted to kinetic energy of course this kinetic energy can be converted to some other energy because when the ball actually falls on earth it creates a crater right so clearly you know you have experience of how to convert uh, uh, gravitational potential energy into some other form of energy okay let's ask this question what is the total potential energy available total potential en- available in sun how do you calculate so you can assume you go to the center and you can keep on constructing uh, whatever you call concentric shells of uh, thickness dr then you can calculate what is the potential that is the integral going from zero to the size of sun g mm by r right g r this is the mass within that radius because i'm going to assume uh, uh, our sun as uh, something like uh, a constant density ball and and then this is the mass of the shell which will be 4 pi r square rho dr so this equation you would have seen 5 by 3 g m square by r and this this value will turn out to be something like 4 into 10 to the 48 ergs so immediately we know in the previous page we calculated what is the requirement it was something like 6 into 10 to the 50 ergs so here you are getting 2 into 10 to the 48 ergs means like definitely within the time scale if you want to extract energy over the time scale this guy will also fail so it's clear that it will be failing by two orders of magnitude that's what we are seeing here so we we can clearly see there are two processes one can think of one is the doing chemical reactions which converts some amount of mass into radiation which you see this is very inefficient second reaction which you can think of is the gravitational potential energy matter falling into the center of the star and converting that potential energy into some sort of kinetic energy and or somehow you convert that into radiation Uh, this doesn't work for stars by the way when you are uh, uh, in the third or second or third week of this uh, school you will find that there are very nice astrophysical situations where this will be used you will use um, potential energy gravitational potential energy to generate uh, 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 radiation okay but for sun or sun like star this doesn't seem to be the case so what could be the reason you all know that where we are heading towards because people keep saying that you want energy you go to nuclear reaction let's do this uh, simple exercise let's consider a nu- nuclear fusion reaction in which four hydrogen atoms combine to give a helium atom okay so what is our our idea so you have four hydrogen atom combining to give a helium atom there will this mass mass of four hydrogen atom minus mass of four he- uh, mass of one helium atom is something like 0.029 times mass of hydrogen atom is very small so basically when you convert hydrogen atom into helium something like 3% of mass will be sort of the total mass which is involved will be lost okay this is this much will go into helium this will be the remaining mass since i am using four hydrogen you know that per hydrogen atom what is the mass loss which is like 0.7% i am sure like you guys have heard about this uh, whenever people do nuclear reaction the efficiency is 0.7% and this is exactly like this so what we are saying is that you can convert four hydrogen atom into helium in this process you will lose little bit of mass okay that's what it is and this now you can say that i know this is the mass i can convert into uh, mc square will give me my energy and energy turns out to be 6 into 10 to the 18 x per gram so it is a good news because you are now above the number which you want right you remember right the amount of uh, energy per gram you need is 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 much slightly less than what you can get by simply burning four hydrogen atom into a helium atom okay therefore what we understand is that therefore even if a small fraction of solar mass uh, is going through a nuclear reaction uh, it, that will be sufficient to maintain the absorbed luminosity for a long period of time because you lose very little amount of uh, mass and you gain enough amount of energy okay so now you can actually write it down in a simple uh, way we can say that what is the total energy available in sun okay now you know that per gram 
you will get 10 to the 18 ergs and you have 2 into 10 to the 30 uh, 2 into 10 to the 33 solar mass of sun so uh, solar mass in sun this is the mass of sun okay this is the energy per unit mass i put a fudge factor fm you say that like this is the fraction of mass of sun which will go through nuclear reaction you don't need all the mass to go through nuclear reaction we say that okay let's say a small fraction goes through that of course if you have heard the astronomy talks before in your college you know that whenever somebody writes down fm obvious number will be 0.1 okay so if you take 0.1 which means that roughly 10 percent of uh, the of solar mass uh, goes through nuclear reaction what will be the energy you can you can find out it will be like close to 10 to the 50 which is what slightly more than 10 to the 50 this is what you want right total energy will be like this now you can ask uh, you can turn it around and say that how long if i take a small fm how long i can have the nuclear reaction going on in stars okay this you can do so how do you calculate you have total energy you divide it by ener divided by energy per unit time the total energy we have we can compute from here energy per unit time is nothing but the rate at which we uh, rate at which sun loses its energy that means luminosity e by l will give you tau so take e which is 1.2 10 to the 52 l 4 into 10 to the 33 and I multiply 3 into 10 to the 7 to convert the time scale into years. And we can clearly see this guy, uh, three. this will be 12, there will be 0 0.1 factor here. And this guy will be something like uh, 10 to the 40. So you will see few times 10 to the 11, actually few times 10 to the 5 years if you take into account the factors. Okay. So say a few times 10 to the 10 years. Okay. That's the lifetime of sun. Okay. That is in the ballpark of what we started with. So it is nice that one can say that if I take f m of 0.1, right, I will get the kind of lifetime of sun. So sun can actually, you form sun and let it go through a hydrogen burning stage means somehow it combines four hydrogen atoms and it gives you one, uh, one helium atom and this process continue. And in this process, you are going to involve only 10% of mass of, uh, mass of sun, not all of them. Okay, then how long it will last? It will last for the time sun has lost it. So it looks like a plausible scenario. So let's go with this plausible scenario. And let's ask how can I combine two hydrogen atoms to form a helium atom? Of course, combining two hydrogen, four hydrogen atoms, you can't do it in one go. So you will do it over a sequence of reactions. And if you have done uh, uh, nuclear physics uh, introductory thing, you would have done it. Otherwise, you just let's go through these reactions. So let's start with uh, PP chain reaction. So you take a proton, proton or hydrogen atom. Two hydrogen atoms are there. Two hydrogen atoms can join to give you deuterium, an electron, and a neutrino. Okay. So in this reaction, you know you will conserve all sorts of things, right? You will conserve charge, you will conserve mass, you will conserve lepton numbers, etc. So what we are going to do is that let's take this reaction. I will go through these reactions and explain significance to astrophysics. So that uh, you, uh, you you will know what 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 is the issue involved. So you have a hydrogen atom, another hydrogen atom, and you have a, you have produced a deuterium. And what is the energy involved? Energy involved is something like one point four MeV. Okay. So you understood this. This is the kind of energy which is involved. And what is the rate at which a reaction can take place? Typically, if you take a 10, 10 to the power six Kelvin gas and the densities are characteristic densities of what one expect in sun we will 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 come to in few minutes and you see that this will be of the order of 10 to the 10 years okay you can form hydrogen you can ask hydrogen to combine with another hydrogen and form deuterium typically it takes very very long time even if you optimize density and temperature you are talking of 10 to the 9 years right okay so what is the problem involved so let's let's look at the problem involved in this thing I want to combine two hydrogen atoms. So what should I do? So hydrogen atom will treat like a proton, right? I take a proton. I have to bring one proton close to another proton. Okay. In a classical sense, it is not possible because these two have same charge. They will support. Uh, they will oppose each other. So really, if you want to bring them close to each other, you have to really make them collide at each other at high speed, like what happens in LHC or any uh, accelerator, right? So, which means the first requirement is to bring two protons to a radius which is of the order of 
nuclear size, right? Nucleus of any atom. It's very small. So we have to bring them together. That means you need high energy, right? or the particles, the proton should be traveling with very large speed. Okay, that's the first requirement. That means in a thermalized situation, you are thinking of a region which is extremely hot. Okay, that's the first point. What to do? Second thing. The second point is that in when you make deuterium, what is the difference between deuterium and hydrogen? You have to create a proton and a neutron. I start with only protons. So somehow I have to con convert. I have first thing I have to bring two protons together. Then I have to convert one proton into an into a neutron so that I can form deuterium. So I need second requirement is that what is known as uh, uh, nuclear uh, interactions or weak interaction where you change a proton into a neutron. So these two means like this is like your quantum problem, barrier penetration problem. You have to actually penetrate a potential, electrostatic potential first, and then you have to you have to make sure that you have uh, enough uh, uh, probability to convert one proton into a neutron. So there are two probabilities. One is the probability to bring them together, right? Second, as close as possible. Second thing is that probability to convert one into a proton. That's why it takes a lot of time. Okay. But in astrophysics, you don't care about probabilities and times because if the if, if the event has less probability, you make the event occur because you have large number of particles. Okay, so usually astronomy, all these uh, low probability things occur in nature because of uh, because of the fact that you are dealing with large number of particles. So let's say that this reaction goes through. If this reaction goes through, then you produce a deuterium. Then what this deuterium can do is that the deuterium can combine. With a hydrogen atom to produce what is known as three helium, of course, uh, and there will be a, a, a release of a release of energy, and this takes place over a time uh, over a time scale of six seconds. Okay, and the energy requirement is of the order of five and a half MeV. Of course, you need higher energy because you are now moving a particle which is twice massive than what you were moving before. For the same temperature, this guy will move root two times less velocity. You know these things, right? Okay. So basically, what happens? I produce hydrogen with very, very long, <laughs> less probability with difficulty. But once I produce a deuterium, the deuterium immediately finds the next hydrogen and produces me what is known as three helium, right? This is process is very easy. Only thing you have to do is to bring these two guys together, but there is no need for you to convert a proton into a neutron or that, that issue is not there. So you produce this three helium. Of course, what you do is that you do twice this reaction. Okay, you start with two hydrogen atom, you produce one deuterium, you have a third hydrogen atom give you three helium. You do it twice, so you will have two three helium uh, uh, atoms produced. When these two three helium atoms can combine to give you one four helium and you will have two hydrogen atom released. So you see that 2, 2, 2 plus 1, 3, twice 6, minus 2, 4. So you have used four hydrogen atoms to actually produce one helium. Of course, this reaction is going to be difficult because you are moving a, a moving two atoms. Now you are moving two atoms, which are four times massive to hydrogen. So probability will go down because at a given temperature, the, the probability of having atoms at these velocities are going to be less. So I suppose that you understood what is going on here. Which means that if I give you little bit amount of hydrogen and ask you to convert a, convert them into helium, you will not be able to do just like that because there is a bottleneck in the sense that you have to produce deuterium. Okay, so you have to produce deuterium, and that is going to take sufficient amount of time. So if I give huge amount of hydrogen to star, the star is not going to lose it in a hurry. It will keep it. That is the first point to remember. Second point to remember is the star. In a star, you should you should have a condition which will give you energetics of the order of MeV, few MeV. Okay, it's clearly we we calculated or we showed that uh, taking the luminosity and size, we get temperature of six thousand Kelvin. This six thousand Kelvin, a, 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 sorry, uh, six thousand Kelvin uh, uh, in whatever region we see, that is not going to produce a nuclear reaction. Uh, clearly, the uh, the region which we are seeing is not the one is, which is sustaining nuclear reaction. There may be some other spot inside the sun which should do this if you think nuclear reaction is the solution.
Okay, but I will proceed with this. But uh, luckily, once you form four helium, or once you form what you call alpha particle, it's very easy for us to produce further elements without much of difficulty, as long as your temperatures are sufficiently high. Okay, because you have to move these massive particles at high speed. So we have two four helium combined to give you beryllium. Of course, this is a, a, a exothermic reaction. You have to give some energy because it's negative. Okay, but beryllium. Once you have beryllium, beryllium will join with helium and give you carbon. So immediately you see you start producing elements which we know carbon is is the element which you can easily produce. And this process goes by the name triple alpha process. I will also spend little more time on one more process, but I will go very rapidly. Okay, so once you form carbon, it is very very interesting that you can go through. what is known as carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle if there is enough carbon in the gas then just mediated by hydrogen you can go through a series of reactions which are known as cno cycle let's spend some time on it then then we can get back okay so take a carbon you combine with a hydrogen you can produce a nitrogen okay nitrogen and some photon so now now this nitrogen is not uh, the standard nitrogen right it is a nitrogen 13 nitrogen 13 can uh, can go to carbon 13 plus electron plus uh, plus a neutrino okay this carbon 13 now can combine with another hydrogen atom produce you nitrogen 14 plus uh, a photon so nitrogen now can go to a isotope oxygen isotope where i can just see that there is a sequence of things just by capture of hydrogen you can go to the first you go to the next elements isotope then capture of one more this thing will bring you to the next element proper stable element something like this so this this exercise can go on so you have a nitrogen which goes to oxygen 15 oxygen 15 giving you nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 15 give you c12 and four helium okay there are two channels which is possible nitrogen 15 can also give you oxygen okay so you can you can just take oxygen and you can go back to nitrogen so i i just leave this slides here and the purpose of showing this reaction is not to teach you all the reaction in a hurry but to tell you that once you have carbon you can go through these reactions known as carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle cno cycle where basically what you are doing is that you have these elements they capture hydrogen subsequently going through these elements in in fact you can come back to nitrogen again or come back to oxygen again but it is also clear that what kind of time scales in all these time scales involved are not very large you see apart from few reactions because this large large time scale reaction won't take place so if you have uh, oxygen going through this process and if there is another another possible possibility oxygen will take the fastest route okay so this is the kind of thing you have to remember or it will remain in oxygen 16 for long enough period so let's pass and say what are you talking about okay let's let's just recollect whatever we said we found the amount of energy which is leaving sun per unit time then we asked what kind of process will give me that kind of energy we concluded that nuclear reaction will be good enough to give that energy what is the nuclear reaction we, we were targeting we were targeting four hydrogen atom joining to give a helium and we found that the energy is sufficient it can last for long long enough time right mass uh, mass whatever mass you have in sun if you use 10% of it you can sustain the amount of energy per unit time released by sun over a period of up to 10 to the 10 years without any difficulty okay fine but practically how do i do it there are two requirement two or three requirements for that right one is that we have to set up nuclear fusion reaction fine we have never never did it in this world a controlled nuclear fusion reaction at high temperature that means you need to have a reactor like this where you you will burst or you will fuse hydrogen to produce helium but that region should remain like this it it cannot blow and expand like a bomb okay you will burn it without producing bomb that means in 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 a nuclear reactor you you put shield the shield has to come from gravity whatever amount of motion this nuclear reaction is going to produce outwards that should be controlled by the gravity gravity should keep these guys well inside that is the first requirement second requirement is that to trigger this kind of reaction you need high temperature so you are looking at some region which has large number of many high energy density should be high temperature should be high you have to you have to establish that right you have to see whether it is there or not okay observationally do we have the signatures 
and then we say that nuclear reaction why only worry about hydrogen you can do helium burning or you can go into cno cycle so what kind of energetics you have that's what is shown in this picture so typical temperatures of the order of 6.10 uh, to the 6 kelvin you 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 usually you will be successful in doing pp chain reactions if you want uh, cno cycle to operate you are talking about 10 to the 7 or more if you want helium burning to happen you are talking about 10 to the 8 you can clearly understand because in, in, here you are moving the particles because you have to move the particle at high speed to collide with each other that is easy to do at low temperature if the particle mass is small okay carbon is like at least one particle is faster because one next particle is oxygen you are moving sorry hydrogen that is lighter particle is only one particle which is basically carbon which is a faster part particle so you gain a bit here all the particles are heavy okay so we are with me now so now we are motivated let's go back to what observations tell us okay let's look at sun's optical spectrum okay optical spectrum of sun is shown here okay this is in nanometer and since the red color is what you observe since you are observing from uh, earth the earth atmosphere produces lot of absorption these features which you are seeing uh, going down are the uh, atmospheric absorption you see in solar spectrum but if you go outside the atmosphere you will uh, uh, you will you will actually get uh, this spectrum uh, uh, which you can fit it with the black body uh, curve planck function like what dipankar was mentioning this morning and you find that the temperature will be of the order of 5250 so you are on the ballpark you are right 5500 kelvin this is the temperature of the sun in the outer part okay now if you take the solar spectrum at a much higher resolution what is done here is that the wavelength go from here to here but the wavelength section is very small so you are going from blue spectrum to red spectrum and each row you are seeing is a small spectral window of the spectrum taken with sun here it looks like a perfect black body a smooth curve modified by the atmospheric absorption but actually when you look at the high resolution spectra of sun you see this large number of these dark lines okay dark regions and these are called absorption lines and sometimes you also know them by fronafer lines okay so solar spectrum when you take solar spectrum you find two things one is that it is a perfect black body of temperature 5500 kelvin or of the order of 6000 kelvin it's not a problem and then you are saying that when you look at the high temperature you also see absorption okay so basically it means that Uh, you have multiple regions in this so let's let's go back again i i see that this has been taught to you yesterday or this morning this is the we can take a simple uh, simple uh, scenario where i have a background source and i'm going to look at the background source in different ways okay okay i look at the background source directly if it is sun if it is a black body i'll find black body spectrum this is i'm not interested in what i'm interested in in the situation i have a source and i have cloud which is in between me and that source and i take the spectrum what will i see this is what is written by this equation di by ds is the change in intensity when the light travel through a distance ds can be written in terms of kappa nu i nu plus j nu or j nu is the local emission i nu is the intensity kappa nu is the absorption coefficients i see that this has been taught to you so i will go slightly faster so this is the final equation you will have the photon which you receive will be the photon which is originating the intensity multiplied by a quantity e to the minus tau and tau is what is known as optical depth so you you i saw dipankar telling you it is integral of uh, kappa into ds okay so that is tau nu and s nu into 1 minus e to the minus tau nu what is s nu s nu is j nu by kappa nu which is nothing but source function i am using this very loosely because i am attending these lectures also i know that this has been taught to you okay so now if tau is very large what is the meaning of tau is very large L large means that there is large amount of optical depth the light from that source will not come to me this term will go so tau is very large means like i am as if i am looking at a cloud whatever light coming from behind will not come to you i will see whatever emission produced by this cloud okay but what is relevant for us is this situation when tau is uh, very small okay what are you going to see what you will see is that so let's make uh, tau very small okay so this term you can expand now in taylor expand this guy will become tau nu into s nu and this guy will be i nu into 1 minus this again you taylor expand these two quantities then we can we can show 
that the spectrum which you will receive will have two components. One is the direct light which is coming from from to you, multiplied by e to the minus tau, which means that wherever there is absorption occurring, you will find these dark lines. Of course, whether you will see an absorption or emission will depend upon Kirchhoff law, which which has been also told to you. If the temperature of this background source is more than the temperature of this cloud, you will see the transition in absorption. If the temperature of the background source is less than this, you will see it in emission. Okay, that's the situation you see here. You Kirchhoff law in a loose way is the body at a temperature, whatever it absorbs, it will emit at low temperature, right? So this is basically what is happening. So what you can learn from this exercise is that whenever you have two layers, one layer is a source which is at higher temperature. There is another layer which is in between the source and you, which is is at low temperature, it is inevitable that you will start seeing absorption lines. Okay, so let's move on. So, what is the picture you are going to develop for sun now? Sun has absorption line. That means you need a hot region from which the black body spectrum should originate. Okay, fine. Or some spectrum should originate. It should be surrounded by a cold gas. You agree with that, right? Because cold gas should be surrounding a hot gas. Now, let's do simple thermodynamics. What do you expect? So if, if I take constant density sphere, suppose if I take the density to be constant between these two layers, what will happen? This guy has higher temperature compared to this cold region. That means since the density is exactly same, this part will have higher pressure compared to the outer part. You are with me now, right? What is the idea of higher pressure? That means there is a pressure gradient going from inner part to the outer part. That means there is a force that this configuration will not remain stable, correct? Because this guy will keep on expanding, because this guy will push it. So a pressure, simple pressure equilibrium between a hot and cold gas like what we have seen here is not possible. So now you will say, no, 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 okay, we are dealing with very massive object. Let's do the following. What we are going to do is that, okay, this gas is hot here, is going to push this cold gas outwards. So this, whatever this gray region I have, you can treat as if this region is trying to go away from you. It's been pushed away from you. But this particle will also experience gravity due to all the mass which is inside. So that will try to pull it towards the center. Okay. So you can ask a question, can I get into an equilibrium where the outward force due to pressure gradient is compensated by the inward force due to gravity? Okay, this goes by the name hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, let's do this hydrostatic equilibrium. What is hydrostatic equilibrium? Basically, you can write down pressure gradient dp by dr goes a row into d phi by dr. What is phi? Phi is my uh, potential, gravitational potential. d phi by dr gives me my force. So dp by dr at any radius will be minus g into mass within that radius by r square into rho. This rho is rho. So now this is the equation I have to satisfy at all radius. If I satisfy this equation at all radius, I'm okay because now I can stabilize an equilibrium. So what are the requirements I want? I want to set up an equilibrium in a situation there is a hot region inside, cold region outside because of which there is a pressure gradient. At each point I measure the pressure gradient, then I know what is the force I'm going to feel towards outside, I have to ensure that mass inside that radius has to be of the order of this value. dp by dr, I know, I can calculate what is the mass given the density. Okay, so It's interesting, that means that I can now have a mechanism by which I can do this. Okay, You can, you can simply see, for example, if you consider, go to the center, so now dp by dr, you can write down as pressure at the surface minus pressure at the center divided by the radius. So this radius, I can put it as radius of sun or in a, in a typical case, I keep it as radius of any sphere. Okay. Then you can write down. So if you say that pressure in the surface is negligible compared to the pressure in the center, you can write down what is the gas pressure in the center given pure hydrostatic equilibrium. Other way of asking is, what will be the pressure felt by the central point if it has to support the full mass of the of the sun okay that turns out to be this one okay so given the density average density i can calculate please remember the pressure will scale as m to the power two third okay so it's it's, a, it's proportional to mass 
but slow function but definitely more massive stars or most more massive objects will have core pressure which is much higher and in a in a loose term pressure is nothing but density temperature that means more massive stars will have more density and more temperature let me pass here to just recollect where are we we set up a requirement for uh, uh, nuclear reaction i i i just uh, held that part hanging we just start two phases for uh, you looked at uh, the fact that you find absorption in the outer surface means that the sun is the whole sun is not at the same temperature good news for us because if that was the case then we would have never uh, never had a chance to produce a nuclear reaction in the center so now we start with this idea that maybe inner part is hotter than the outer part then what how do i keep this gas together otherwise this gas will expand because uh, i i have to go if i want to actually i, I forgot to tell you if i want to really match if, uh, uh, match pressure equilibrium this region i have to make it less dense okay because the pressure between these two region should match if the density is same this guy should become less denser if pressure equilibrium is there that we don't want we want it to be hotter and denser so that we can produce nuclear reaction uh, in the central region that is the motivation okay so to achieve this we set up what is known as hydrostatic equilibrium hydrostatic equilibrium is nothing but pressure gradient felt at any point should be matched by the gravitational potential uh, gradient mm. per unit mass or whatever you can think of so uh, uh, so dp by dr we have so just the challenge for you is that you go to each radius and simply find out what is the pressure gradient and make sure that mass inside that radius will support the pressure gradient you, you can see that it's an iterative process where you can match it okay given that we have some simple expression for a pressure in the core of the any object which is in hydrostatic equilibrium and it depends on uh, density mass in this way okay right. we know the what are, what is the requirement now so we need pressure we need density we need mass okay so these are the things we have to we have to deal with of course uh, uh, if you see pressure and density and we uh, uh, in this equation you you can make it interesting by replacing pressure with density this is what is known as equation of state if you know the composition of matter you can replace p goes rho to the power gamma right this this we can do so i'll i'll come in one one minute so in principle with proper choice of density and temperature and pressure gradients or density gradients one will be able to form a stable star you can actually form a star which will satisfy all these conditions but it is interesting it is much more complex than this kind of picture hot inside cold outside because each point you have to satisfy this equation so what is the requirement so we require t equal to 10 to the 3 kelvin in the outer part okay so that's what sun is right sun gives you 6000 kelvin so you you don't want uh, outer part to be much hotter than that but you need uh, the inner part to have temperature more than 10 to the 6 kelvin because uh, i want to have nuclear reaction taking place at the densest possible region i would like to put it in the middle because the middle has to support the whole mass if i wanted to think of like i don't want this guy to gravitationally collapse to the center so where i need maximum pressure it's a central point so i say that okay let me make nuclear reaction in the center then what do i need i need to move my hydrogen atom at high speed and i want to make sure that they collide very frequently that means the density between density of the particle per unit volume or mass per unit volume should be very large particles should should move at high speed that means the central region has to be much more denser and hotter so instead of like two region you can imagine as if there is a gradient of density going from center to outside temperature going from center to outside right and pressure you can calculate if you know the nature of this object okay so how do you do it okay so this picture i don't know how it appears <laughs> this i quickly drew with my hand let's have a simple analogy which we see in our uh, i think i will do this uh, transparency and stop okay let's do a simple analogy so i have a flow pipe through which some liquid is flowing this uh, liquid is going to fall into a, a collecting vessel uh, i could have put this outlet anywhere i just put somewhere here so what happened in the be beginning t equal to 0 water flows and water start collecting up to some level 
then i i i reach a situation that this water has reached this tap and it will start flowing out like this so if i reach a steady state situation where there is no there, there is an initial announcement in the water level and water level reach some some height and then afterwards as a function of time it is not going to change okay fine very good then what happens this water whatever amount of water which is flowing in will be equal to the amount of water which is flowing out so this is m dot inflow will be equal to m dot flow here i can have some other well, uh, bucket or whatever pot here which collects again again some time scale will be there and this will be there so in this i can put n number of them on the way i don't even know which is the source uh, source which gives me water if somebody tells me you are in a steady state of n number of vessels in between this and that there is some time taken for the water to flow but if i just measure the amount of water m dot mass of water per unit time flowing through this i can simply say what is the flow rate at the source itself okay this is provided everywhere it is equilibrium so let's simply see what has happened you start with with the tap it took some time to reach this equilibrium in this thing then this guy will reach some equilibrium here then this fellow will there so till these all the subsequent regions get some sort of an equilibrium i will not have a flow which is which is consistent with the flow which is here but once all the regions have reached some sort of agreement equilibrium between them that means nobody is going to stop suddenly say up to some level uh, uh, tap water is allowed and suddenly it is stopped in between it's uh, then you will have problem in in this argument but if there is no source or sink between the inner part of or the original location of the source of water and the place where i am seeing it can be between mumbai and pune or it can be between himalaya and uh, wherever you can think of right in, in kolkata you can figure out what is the rate at which something is starting by looking at the rate at which you are seeing here but that doesn't mean that this water is created from the pot right <laughs> just because i see the pot i cannot say water is created from the pot so this analogy is exactly what we are going to do this is the place in the case of sun nuclear reaction is going to take place somehow you have to transfer this energy per unit time to subsequent regions which are in some sort of equilibrium what is this equilibrium this is the equilibrium which we have demonstrated in the previous page which is known as hydrostatic equilibrium and you are going to maintain the flow as you come so first thing is you have to transport the energy when you transport the energy you have to make sure that whatever equilibrium you have established is not violated correct each region the equilibrium will remain the same if you do that then amount of energy you receive in the outermost once it reaches the outermost part the photon released from the outermost part will free free propagate in the in the uh, whatever you call inter inter interplanetary medium and you will reach us okay like that's what we are finding and we are saying that okay i received this much energy but from a source which is 10 to the 3 kelvin so it's clear now you understand right even though we are receiving huge amount of energy from 6000 kelvin outer surface it doesn't mean that the energy is created there actually energy is flowing like this if you understand this picture i think this is what we are going to do here okay what is the requirement now requirement is that energy per unit time generated at the center of the star should be equal to the absolute luminosity and there is no accumulation of energy anywhere while transporting the energy okay fine then what is the way you will transport energy you will transport energy by radiation this is the most efficient way because this is the fastest way to go but the transporting energy has to be done carefully for example for some reason i generate energy in the central part of the sun and it does not interact with anything right the energy just comes straight to me then what happened the region between between me and uh, whatever region between the outer surface of the sun and the inner part is no more interacting with photon that means there is no energy exchange between photon and uh, this thing then what happens uh, you will uh, you will find that uh, uh, mm, the process is useless let's take this analogy and say what i mean instead of simply flowing it here so because of this flow this guy went here and it went here and i got a flow if i just push huge amount of uh, uh, pressure here I, i i i i put a piston so this flow instead of falling here it can directly come towards me then this guy will never 
get to an equilibrium configuration because it is not receiving uh, the the water it is supposed to receive. That means it breaks the sequence, right? So exactly like this. If a transport mechanism, whatever I'm choosing, if this mechanism does not interact with all the particles on its way, it will not be able to heat and cool the gas as it comes out, right? So the way the transport will be done is that you will take a layer. The inner layer will give some energy to this layer. This layer will give energy to the subsequent layer. The rate of inf inward energy and outward energy will remain time invariant so that you will always maintain this. Which means that if I am taking photons, uh, if you take a propagation through radiation, I have to make sure that the photon created will interact with matter and the matter will radiate and this radiation will interact with the subsequent matter that will radiate like that. This photon will if you want to think of like a statistical mechanics problem, the photon will actually random walk outwards. Our uh, physics way of saying is that it is diffusion. The photon will diffuse rather than free propagate. So what is the way a photon can interact with the matter? We all, all know because I listen to you <laughs> again. You can't say I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing you guys. So I'm guessing that you are saying in between. So basically what will happen? The photon can get scattered. You can think of Thomson scattering. I you found actually Compton, inverse Compton, whatever scattering can take place. And this scattering goes by the name free free. You know that before the absorption, the photo, uh, the particle was free. After the emission, particle was free. So the transition uh, of uh, whatever transport of energy takes place between free particle. So it's called free free. Okay. And you also see synchrotron going through all that. This won't happen here. Here we are talking about Bramshalam or or uh, um, Compton scattering, right? This is the free-free transition. You also see bound-free. Bound-free goes by the name recombination, uh, ionization, or free bound goes by the name recombination. Free means the electron was in, in, in free, and it combines to the uh, inner part in, to an atom. It releases a photon. But if you remove the electron in the inner part of an atom, and if it becomes a free electron, you lose some amount of photon. That's called absorption. And you can also have bound-bound transitions means like uh, Photon is absorbed, electron goes to an excited state, and it comes back to the ground state. And, and then you can have radiation. Okay, basically, radiative transport can happen, but here there is a slight difference. We want to make sure that photon interacts with particle. Okay, right. The other thing you can think of, okay, do I have some time? Uh, maybe I... Uh, I don't know, right? So maybe I will I'll go to this tomorrow because I, I have five minutes left and I will just check with uh, the um, uh, organizers whether uh, I can yeah. stop here. So Anand, uh, if you want to take questions, I would suggest to stop here. Uh, that's what I thought I'll stop here and I'll take some questions, okay? Okay, so if you have asked a question during the lecture on chat, please raise your hands. Okay, so we can take a question from Parmita Pandey. I'm unmuting you. Hello? Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, sir, so my question is that uh, if the gas between the source and the observer, if it is even hotter than the source, then the um, there will be some emission from the gas also, like uh, as we have studied. Yes. So how will we distinguish if the emission line is from the source or from the gas? Um, it's hotter than the source. So usually uh, what happens is that uh, uh, in astrophysical situations, uh, you, you, you find that uh, there are relative motions. Okay. Uh, th that will distinguish uh, between uh, uh, the, the Doppler shift will shift the lines. If, if there are two medium, uh, both are emitting the same transition and if there is no relative velocity between them, I think it is difficult to distinguish, okay? So you can't distinguish, so suppose you find an emission line, you cannot distinguish whether it is coming from one source or two, sto two sources with no relative motion between them, if both of them are at the same temperature. Okay, so we have one question from Himadri Saha. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, 
So you have seen that in the nuclear processes, a photon is released. Uh, but my question is, are the photons have some specific frequencies or they are emitted at a continuum? Because we know that the eventually follows the black body spectrum. No, no. Uh, okay. So nuclear energy, this is, a, this is like a energy, right? Energy released. Okay. You can think of like a uh, photon of energy means like it, 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 it is like a, if several reaction goes on, this energy will be like a black body spectrum equivalent, right? If it is a tight interaction. So that's, uh, that's the idea here. You, this is some sort of energy which will be in the form of photons, but uh, it, it won't be same value, right? It is some sort of uh, range of energy you will get. So uh, the very high energy, it will be like gamma rays. The extreme large energies, you see them as gamma rays. And gamma rays uh, uh, actually interacts with the surrounding uh, medium if it happens. And that heat is, will be like a black body. But if these gamma rays uh, come to you, it will be like a gamma ray. The energy will be like the energy of the gamma rays. Okay, so there have been several questions asking whether you will be providing your slides so that we can upload them onto the wiki page. I, I will, I will uh, just now do it. Okay, no problem. Okay, great. Uh, so we have a question from Unix in Gupta. I've unmuted you, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, I have a question regarding the T-alpha, triple alpha process that you just discussed. Yeah. So in that process, we have to apply some energy from outside, right? Yeah. Uh, so how is that process uh, contributing towards the energy generation from the start? No, 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 you should not see. That is intermediate step only, right? See that uh, the energy what you are giving you see that is very small amount of energy. I, I just uh, didn't share it. If you want, I can go back and show you. Mm. Yeah, that would be a pleasure. Too. So, just to see, it is few keV only. It's a hundred keV. But this process, once you get beryllium, it actually rapidly, here there is energy. You gain 74 MeV, but you are losing 95 keV. It is not much, right? The energy required is very less. That is the, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a question from Karthik Gananath. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, my question is that, we, we have a turbulences occurring on the surface of the sun. Yeah. So does it, does it affect the temperature of the sun or any of the reaction that happens? In the sun? Mm. So uh, actually surface, so I, 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 I try to understand what you want. Okay, see, when we say black body spectrum, uh, if you are thinking of temperature, so the 6,000 Kelvin, whatever, 5,000 something, uh, that is the uh, average over the full surface, right? You are taking the, the average temperature equivalent of average black body spectrum coming from all over the place. Okay. Yes. But we know that the sun can also go through all the various things happen in the surface of the sun. Energetically, that is that is important. But total energy wise, this is much more dominant. This is what we call as a black body spectrum. This is dominant. The reactions, this has nothing to do with what happened in the nuclear reactions, right? So, uh, Okay, I, I think in, uh, if you go to finer detail, nobody understands uh, the various things which are happening in the surface of the sun. Right? Like you also have a very hot gas which is uh, present there, that is known as corona and all. I will not talk about it. Probably somebody else will teach you the surface of sun at some level. But as far as stars are, stars are concerned, overall understanding of a black body uh, radiation modified by the absorption produced by the outer layer is a good enough description for for whatever purposes we want to. Okay, let's take a question from Shri Shroy. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so when the initial burst of a star is happening and we have a few atoms involved in the reaction, so what is providing that shield that you had mentioned to keep, to contain the reaction inside and not allowing the entire reaction to just explode and go off? Uh, so good. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure, like you, you can um, you can anticipate that this kind of things I will be doing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so next slide will be uh, next set of thing is that now. See, I'm teaching slightly uh, non-standard way. I'm not going to teach exactly like the way people will teach from textbooks. So next part I will take it up is that how do you form a star in the first place itself? Okay. All right. 
Okay. Yeah. So yeah. We, we will try to set up this density gradients. We will see requirements, and you will find that if you are not satisfied by end of tomorrow, you can ask me again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we'll take a question from Saikat Mazumda. Uh, one muted you. Go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Good, good afternoon. Okay. So my question is that. How do we derive the equation of state of any star? Uh, this is a bit tricky. Um, it's uh, it's difficult to write a single equation of state for thing like sun, okay? Because the equation of state is a connection between pressure and uh, um, and density. density. Because in the case of sun, what happens is that as you go interior. Um, the see simple thing I will tell you analogy. Take hydrogen atom at temperature some t, number density is n. What is the pressure? You will say n t, right? N k t. Okay. Hydrogen atom. If I make it into electron and proton, your pressure will double, isn't it? Because I have n number of electron, n number of proton. Earlier I have only n number of hydrogen atom. So the the pressure actually depends on the ionization state of the gas and uh, what kind of chemical composition. Uh, uh, mass is there. If the all mass is in carbon or all mass is in hydrogen, it will be different. So usually people don't worry about this equation of state when you deal with uh, stars. Whereas it may become interesting when you deal with uh, dead stars like uh, um, whatever you call uh, white dwarfs or neutron stars, because there you can treat as if the material is made of a particular kind, right? Uh, a degenerate electron or whatever. So I will touch upon it at some stage. The equation of state is talked about only on these extremely compact stars, not on the star kind of stars. I will spend more time on. Okay. I hope I answered. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Okay. So uh, okay, there was one person who has dropped out. Fine. So there is a question from uh, Meet Mehta, who says that their mic is not working. So I will just. Uh, read it out. Does radiation pressure exceed gravitational force for high mass stars more than 100 solar masses? And what is the Eddington limit? Uh, so there are two questions. So like one question, it definitely uh, uh, it happens even in normal stars, not necessarily 100 solar mass. Uh, even in uh, 10 solar mass stars, so you have uh, what is known as uh, pressure radiation pressure driven uh, winds. So uh, uh, this happens. So you can uh, outer uh, uh, in in massive stars, outer part which we whatever we saw as photosphere, need not be stable because it it can whenever you produce absorption, uh, whenever some gas absorbs, it also absorbs some amount of photon momentum. So it will have a radiatively uh, sorry radially outward force. So radiation pressure drives winds in in stars. So it is clearly there. Uh, Eddington thing, I will not say much about it because um, you are not worrying about accretion kind of thing. So Eddington comes when there is accreting matter and there is a radiation from inside, you actually match uh, these things. So, so answer to your question, yes, uh, radiation pressure is extremely important uh, in massive stars. Okay, another question from Suprabha Mukhopadhyay, whose mic is also not working. So in the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, is PC the excess or absolute pressure at the center? Oh, the way I have said is uh, it's a absolute pressure. But uh, uh, you, as you can guess that uh, nobody does like this, right? The radius is so large. <laughs> it's just for you to have a feel. Uh, this is the core pressure you can think of. OK, so now maybe we can just uh, glance at the Google document for the YouTube questions. I have given you. I just pasted the link in your chat, Anand, if you don't have it already. I have already opened it and kept somewhere. Okay. So I can so see. I think only a couple of questions have been selected, but you can also see the list of all questions. Yeah, you know. I think uh, I can do this too. Uh, one question is related to how to calculate mass of the star, including sun. Actually, we will use uh, Newton's law. Uh, mm, Basically, uh, sun is calculated because distance to planets are known. If you know the period of uh, orbital, uh, Kepler's law actually, not Newton's law. You use Kepler's law. So if you know the distance to uh, the planet and the orbital period, you can calculate mass. Okay, And sun mass is more or less consistently uh, calculated because of this. 
uh, otherwise uh, you will always use uh, okay kepler problem you binary you can calculate the masses so you use kepler's law that's the simplest answer a bit on the role of negative hydrogen ion uh, so i have not talked about negative hydrogen ion so i will uh, i will skip answering this uh, Okay, negative hydrogen ion uh, is an intermediate stage which occurs in the intermediate mass stars. So I don't know. I, I have not taught something. Uh, maybe if uh, this person who ever asked this question uh, is still want to uh, ask me again, you ask me tomorrow, because by then at least we would have done the transport through uh, through the sun. Because I have not done it. Because if you ask question, I don't know like uh, uh, what to answer. Otherwise, I can. If you are still insisting, I will answer it tomorrow. Okay. negative ion is okay it's like any other intermediate uh, is it provides an opacity which is important in intermediate or low mass stars okay that's the simplest answer i'll just look at other thing otherwise we'll take one last question from here also yeah wait one minute yeah, see yeah, fm okay. somebody says what is fm this is a fraction of mass which goes through the nuclear reaction can we produce pp chain reaction in lab excellent uh, people will be very happy if we can do it but uh, unfortunately we cannot do do you saw the temperatures okay i don't see anything else which is uh, this serious for us to say because some of these things uh, dipankar has already explained so if you guys don't uh, follow uh, follow things related to radiation whatever i talked about please listen to dipankar once more in his thing so uh, that's all i have from here i okay. can take uh, we'll take one last question here from akash choudhury uh, one muted you go ahead hello good afternoon sir what good afternoon sir in that uh, the last the last answer you told about that fraction of mass undergoing nuclear reaction sir mm -hmm. how how do we decide that fraction like depending on the star or something no 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 uh, okay so you have to remember that whatever i am doing is not the because sir like uh, after that nuclear reaction that formation of neutrons and and all this process happening so like is it important in deciding whether when it will go or no you have to understand the way in which i am teaching this equation yes, the idea is to find out can i use small amount of mass to produce large amount of energy over a large period of time so yes, what sir. i have demonstrated to you is that you need uh just about 10% is good enough right i am not saying that you will <laughs> each star you will decide what percent the star will decide by uh, how much nuclear reaction it can sustain depending upon its mass it's so mass what you have to remember is that don't remember the initial part of lecture what i will say whatever i said remember the the uh, discussion related to uh, whatever you call hydrostatic equilibrium so what do we concluded each layer suppose if the layer is forming nuclear reaction it is producing energy it is trying to yes. push the material outwards right yes. so i have to make sure that the place at which the mass can mass will decide what is the density mass will decide yes mass or radius radial dependent density and temperature will decide it we will not decide okay yes okay sir thank you okay so i think uh, we can end here today thank you thank you all yeah all right see you so i will send you this uh,